Welcome to Keith and the Girl. I'm Keith Malley. I'm Chemda. Get your ticket now to our silent trailers game show. It's next week. Chris Gethard is joining the lineup. We have Michael Ian Black, Pete Holmes, and I'm very excited. Yeah, what an incredible lineup. This yep. is going to be amazing. And I think you should worry a little because I think between those three alone, they kind of have a range of movies that I bet they know. You right. know, they're yeah. uh, they're pop culturally. Yeah. Mm hmm. But like uh, deep cuts also. So I'm going to be describing it extra stupid this uh, next weekend. So prepare. Keith and the girl dot com slash tickets. You'll see everything right there. Happy sweet 16. This person writes Chloe. I give Chemda and Keith, a.k.a. mom and dad. <laughs> I give very healthy dumps about this letter so you can and tell they care. Well, we raise them right with nice dumps. Uh, I'm a 36 C. Good to know. OK, T today was my first ever day of OMAT. And wow, it felt amazing. Oh, I got to wake up and start my day with Chemda and Xerxes 7 a.m. here in PDX. Keith PDX stands for Portland as in Oregon, not podcast Dick Expo. LOL. Well, I was guessing I finished two of the three things for my procrastination to do list. This includes following through with legal help on a divorce from a, from an estranged husband that I originally filed paperwork for two years ago. Talk about procrastination, but I'm finally healed now and I'm ready to move on as my rating exercise and also in celebration and appreciation of your now 16 years on air and in my ears. I would like to personally share just how deeply you have helped me. I, too, got my first iPod, saw the podcast section in iTunes and found you in the top 10. I was in sixth grade, 12 <laughs> or 13 years old. Oh, no. It's, I don't know if I could still like this letter. I feel right. like it's illegal. And I'm and this is a trap. Well, she says I'm 26 now. Uh, uh, OK, 12. Were you 12 when you started listening? Oh, boy. you are my longest relationship. And I can say in confidence because I distinctly remember putting that same iPod on shuffle when I was hanging out with my very first boyfriend and his friends. And an episode came up in my library where Hemda was reading an ad for the candy cane glass dildos from Adam and Eve. I still use mine, by the way. You know, I do think it's important that young people know about masturbation. I don't want to be the one to tell them about it, but please, as an adult or whatever, it's healthy. Let out the demons and yeah. be a better person. One of my stepkids act up. I go, do you got to go whack okay. off or okay. something? Okay. You know, it's going to be the weirdest show we've ever done. OK, <laughs> I also remember downloading a bunch of shows to listen to when I was really struggling to connect with anyone and anything and going through what I now understand to be depression, anxiety and at times self-harm. I'm fortunate to say that I now work with a therapist regularly and your show largely helped destigmatize mental health and illness and my journey to get the help I need. And then she writes, insert better, better help ad here. <laughs> it's true. The things that we could do to ourselves that start in the brain that we're just like, oh, this is just the way I think I'm broken. I'm, you know, messed up. Um, there's no other step here other than the only step that I see in this narrow view that has developed in my brain is just, you know, when you have that narrow view, when there's not just when when there's only one choice in front of you know that there's a second choice. That's it. Just know it. So maybe it could be found somewhere else other than your brain at the moment. I always plan to come to meet up. Sadly, 2020 was the year where I finally had the oh. job income and paid time off oh. <laughs> to make it to Keith's uh, birthday extravaganza, his yearly stand up show. But I still hope to meet you someday. I'll be emotional and my heart will be racing as it is now writing this. To be honest, you're the voice inside my head throughout the majority of my life and growth and one of the few constants for me. Thank you from the bottom of my heart of, of my heart for keeping up with your show in the most ever evolving, creative, tactful, professional and caring way. I love you, as do many of your listeners. I'm sure. Thank you so much. I would like to interact on the forums and meet other listeners, but I feel like it's not my strong suit. I've been VIP for, I think, a year now, and there's no going back now. It's a must. The content you put out is amazing. Chew and A and last week are my favorite and supporting my face favorites is completely worth fitting into the budget. Peace, love and Keith and the girl, Chloe. Chloe, first of all, if we ever meet, just know we are not scared of tears. Feel free, whatever mm -hmm. it is. We love emotion. Keith might learn a fourth one. So like there's <laughs> good in a lot of things. I cannot wait to meet and hug you. Thank you so much, Chloe. And Wednesdays, 
Of course, we show up in the chat room, keithandthegirl.com slash chat. Say hi, or at least eavesdrop. It's not overwhelming. It's yeah. uh, it's a real fun group. You know, when I first went to Surf Reality, I eavesdropped. Ba- basically, uh, so this was a, a venue on the Lower East Side where Keith and I met, where um, it was an art house. I used to go, we used to go to the open mic um, on Sunday nights, and uh, so much stuff happened there. And I just went to watch, and I was like, I really want to get on stage, but I don't think I fit in here. I'm not weird enough. And so, right. you know, I just I just kind of like took it in until I was comfortable enough to go on stage. I think the same thing can happen in all of our community. Sit there, get the vibe. You know, if you're shy, sit there, get the vibe. And I was thinking as you were reading that, Keith, I don't know if we should do it or not. Maybe we should ask the people in the chat that we regularly are in every Wednesday night. Um, when I go to meetings, um, anonymous meetings, Sometimes in those meetings, they have a space and a time for newcomers just to say hi. Right. So that if you're overwhelmed by the entire rest of the meeting, let's say 1230, call it. Uh, any newcomers just want to say hi or share their story or whatever. And then we go back to regular shares. I wonder if that would work well in this scenario. Let's roll it around, workshop it in our brain. OK, OK. okay. Well, before I introduce to you uh, the return of uh, today. Oh, and by class. the way, that's not going to be mandatory. It's just a space for it. OK, and now back to our regularly scheduled program. Anytime Kendra can give herself uh, more to work on. It's a good day for <laughs> thank you. I- I'll mention it. I'll mention better help. H.E.L.P. Kenda does use this, loves the therapy and counseling she's getting. A better dot com. H.E.L.P. slash K.T.G. Join over one million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Yeah, it's interesting that I have the information in my head, but saying it out loud to another person, as you're saying it, you're noticing which words you're hesitating on. You're noticing which ones you're you're thinking you're embarrassed to say, even though it's a therapist, which is like, you know, level playing ground. So even just sort of facing that going, I don't want to share this. Why don't why don't I? And then just kind of you know, throwing it up anyway, because that's the space to do it. It's so good and it's so easy to use. This is a very helpful app. I love, 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 love it. Go to betterhelp.com slash KTG and get 10% off your first month. OK, you'll see everything right there. I think you're going to be a fan. I have friends who uh, who are part of this. And, you know, my friends, they don't have feelings either. And they're getting <laughs> in touch with them. And uh, and it's very, very fun to see. The other day when we were talking about celebrating 16 years podcasting, I read this message from Kirk Russell and he said, politics aside, I love Keith and the girl. Congrats on 16 years of bringing forward funny people that I would not have met. Thanks. And when we were saying it's funny, though, what could I possibly be saying? That's so political. Well, I I feel like all of our language has been politicized. Like, I don't think being gay is a political issue, but it has been politicized, you know, so it's like, well, how can I stay away by sharing my life? I'm being political. And I said, thanks. Now fix your politics. And we're getting along fine. Somebody else, though, not as friendly, jumped on it. Jack from Connecticut and says, I agree. Not happy with the political slant the show has taken on. How about the world? How about the slate the world has taken on? Now, now, Keith, All right. getting into politics. Listening for more than a decade, but it might be time to move on if they can't find a better balance. Oh, I know, because we have a poll with every show so you can vote every time. Politics, every show. How did I not see this? Oh, my God. When the people write in, it is illuminating. Jack with all his power. I'm I'm close. I'm close to unsubscribe. I've been listening 10 years, but if you don't get it together. We're out of five stars, but I'm holding that fifth star. (laughs) It could be yours. I might move on if they don't find a better balance. That's what my mother should do. That's how we get back in touch. She's like, I have a system now. At the end of every call, I give you a certain number of stars. And I'm like, you know what? I heard that makes people feel good. Go right ahead. And of course, I write back. I say, "Okay, maybe we can agree on some Nazis. (laughs) Right. I understand there's other sides to things. You're a man of the people. He says, it's your and Kenda's show to talk about whatever you want right here. I, 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 I see red. What a simple, stupid fucking thing to say. It's your show. I know it is. And you have your right to what? Talk. You deep fuck. You know what? This is great because we have done 16 years and we established that 
the sixth episode called Jeff the Jerk Off was the first time you went on a on one of your crazy yelling rants. Yes. So you got to do it at the beginning of the year. And I'm glad we're getting into it now. Go ahead, Keith. You let them know that you can speak and you have a voice in this country and around the world. I've enjoyed supporting your show because it has brought me a ton of laughs to pretend there is only one side of things is naive and childish. Childish. <laughs> yeah. Uh, something your dad might do. Oh, oh shots fired. you son of a gun. Oh. That's where it gets me. Oh. That's where it gets. You know, I don't like my dad. Oh, you no, know I don't like my father. Oh, oh, that is good. That is a good burn. Ooh, Hulk smash. Out of a bitch. <laughs> Your ad, oh. dad might be political, Keith. Son of a bitch. Oh, no. Betterhelp.com slash K-A-T-G. You got me where it hurts. Alert. Trigger alert. Uh, to pretend there's only one side of things. Wear a mask and try not to be a Nazi. That's as political as I think I get. All right. I'm out of here. That's too much. Right. Uh, this person, Blitzgal, says, I started listening before you guys even had numbers on your episodes. I think I'm around the same age as you two. I just turned 44. I just really loved your personalities from the beginning. I, for one, love how political you guys have been over the years. So, so political. This is so funny. If anyone called me political ever, I'd be like, yeah. wow, I don't know the names of anybody. I am amazed that I knew Joe Biden was the president, you right. know? Also, you guys took this seriously and treated it like a business from the beginning. And that makes a huge difference when it comes to entertaining content. I've tried countless other podcasts over the years, and yours is the only one that has been a consistent go to listen for all of these years. Well, Aww. thank you. Thank you. That's Ladies. politics. Yeah, that's politics. All right, here we go. Today's guest. It's his return. I was listening the last time uh, he was on Keith and the girl. And uh, it's a hoot and a half. I'll tell you that. Ladies and gentlemen, Murph Meyer. Hello. Murph. Thanks so much for having me. Remind me what Murph is short for. It has to be right. It is. Yeah, it's a nickname I got when I was a kid. I used to dye my hair all different colors. My real name is Matthew uh, and Matt. Uh, and so uh, one of one of my buddies when we were teenagers said, what do you get when you cross Matt with a Smurf? Because I had blue hair. Mm. So Murph. And then I was like, yeah, thanks, Tommy. That was a dumb joke. But then <laughs> and here we are. And I, wow. Uh, <laughs> wow. You uh, know, comedians try forever to make one of their jokes stick. Yep. And that guy just got it. Tommy, I man, it. Tommy, I just fucking got it. Yep. <laughs> By the way, on, on the last time you were on and you could go to Keith and the girl dot com slash and type in any guest name and see all the times they were on. Uh, Diana was with you, of course. Yes. yes uh, your wife. Mm -hmm. uh, seven years now. Right. Congrats. That's right. Thanks you. Thank you. Yeah, we did seven years. I think that was man. That was a while ago that we were there. We actually were in person. We could smell each other and, yeah. and and be in Queens together. And yeah, that was a whole different world we were in them. But yeah, yeah. We and Diana were together. That was a fun. That was a fun romp. Who knew that we'd be craving smelling each other and being in Queens? Mm -mm -mm. Yes, I don't know why that's right where I went. Not that we could touch each other or that we could really like, you know, connect. Right. Eye to eye. I was like, no, I just want the sniffs. I just want to be able to smell each other. It's also true. I had that moment where I'm like, I have not smelled anybody but my boyfriend in forever. And then I'm like, what am I smelling people? It's just Those I just pheromones. I just haven't smelled anyone. I know. No, I haven't smelled any but myself and I stink to high hell. So I need to like get out there and have other people uh, giving <laughs> off some some musk. I also wanted to just say uh, to follow in the footsteps of your listeners. I'm a 38 B if, if we're saying <laughs> what our bra sides are as we're jumping in just so that's on the table. Um, Thank you, because otherwise we just sound sexist. Right. Yeah. No, here's <laughs> here's, here's a fellow telling you he's a 38 B. <laughs> what um how are you holding up during the pandemic how are you and your wife uh Ooh, we're doing over? we're doing all right we got it we got it we got a pup uh we got a dog like right before a couple of months before uh this it all went down and i'll, I'll tell you like as far as emotional support she's just like a wonderful 100 pound lap dog who just is you know really great and so that truly kind of kept our sanity i think in the early stages uh, uh in the middle and the late i mean it just keeps going on but it's been great to have a dog. Um, yeah, well, I saw that episode of Sex in the City where the couple that always fights, they get a dog and now they yell at the dog instead of each other and they have yes. love for each other. Yes, you puppeteer the dog. Yeah, the dog becomes then the uh, or you can speak through it. Some people speak like to speak through their dogs. So it's kind of a you can you know they're almost like a therapist where you're working through shit by talking to the dog. Yeah. Now, I uh, Murph, comedian, writer, uh, all this. We were on uh, a while ago, of course, uh, you mm -hmm. had the podcast Menage a Trois. Yes. And we were uh, we were on that. And then some time went by and you're starting a new podcast. Yes. And it's called Murph Meyer is self-medicated. 
And this is what I want to talk about today. Mm -hmm. There's a movement called. Uh, uh, harm reduction, it's called harm reduction. Yes, what, this sounds like you're you mentioned here. I, I'm going to read the little uh, blurb. Mm -hmm. Submedicated is a podcast hosted by Murph Meyer, a comedian, former heroin addict and current alcoholic. Now, that sounds like you're still drinking, right? Yes. OK, on each two part episode, Murph will riff on some topical drug related uh, stories from the news, interview folks from all walks of the harm reduction movement and share personal stories of his own experience using drugs for damn near 30 years now. So, uh, Self-medicated is made by drug users for drug users. Murph's comedic point of view is inspired and informed by harm reduction, which he currently practices to manage his own chaotic substance abuse that you've done. You've done everything right from a uh, nitrous to acid to heroin, all the drugs. Yeah, I've done a lot of pretty much all the drugs. Uh, now, the kids have some of these new chemical compounds. Uh, you know, the the uh, DMT is one I did do, but you got like DTK 946. I, I don't know all of those new fa newfangled drugs, but, mm -hmm. you know, for people in our around our age, 40 years old, I've done a lot of the uh, pretty much all the drugs. Now, I imagine I know the answer is heroin, but what was your favorite? Yeah, that you got it. Yeah, heroin. Heroin's the, the top shelf of the uh, of the opioid cabinet. There is is probably is the best medicine. Uh, but the I one that you have to get off of is usually the best, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. The one that you just can't. Yeah, you just can't get enough of. Um, Yeah. And I think with the harm reduction uh, kind of, you know, saying that I'm informed by that, I'd been practicing harm reduction for about 15 years. Probably the last time I used heroin, it's been about 15 years. But since then, I've used uh, I still drink. I smoke some weed, psychedelics here and there. Uh, and I, 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 so it's I, easy to be sober, right? <laughs> it doesn't sound too tough. Yes. So, yeah. So, so, so that's kind of like the difference between the more traditional, you know, there's a lot of podcasts out there about addiction and recovery and, you know, comedians tend to be, uh, you know, we're in kind of the, it seems to be common uh, for us to, I don't know if it's cause we uh, insist on taking peeks behind the curtain all the time and trying to analyze society. That'll, that'll drive you a little bit, uh, you know, to maybe to drink or to whatever your your uh, your escape of choice or your medication. Or do you do you wonder sometimes if it's actually the same number, but we're the ones who talk about it more openly because we have the power of deflection, but like masking it as this storytelling? I think I, I do actually agree with that. I think that I, and I'm just going to disagree with my own bullshit that I just said. That. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, no, no, no. It's true. I think that narrative. I, I don't know that, that that there's no study that I've right. seen that says like that we are it's just that. For you know, me, yeah, neither, we're a little yeah. more open. Yeah, no, I, I think that a lot of people use drugs uh, for all different reasons. Uh, and some people can manage their substance use. Some people can't. So it's kind of like a whole spectrum, which harm reduction has sobriety and abstinence. If that's your goal and if that is what you want to do, like that's absolutely all a part of it. It's just that that might not be the only thing for everyone, because those kind of and I know you had mentioned him you're in, you know, a. a in a program as well, an anonymous. I don't know what, you know, Al-Anon. I don't you know, yep. I'm always a little hesitant to bring it up, even though people won't think that I am because they probably think I bring it up all the time. But <laughs> there's there's that issue of being in the public about it. And it's supposed to just be behind the scenes. But I didn't know it existed. And it's part of my life. So I I try to not talk about it too much, but I bring it up. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and and that's, I think, the the part of like lifting that stigma a little bit is is to be like, like you said, I, comedians are a little open about it because we love to self flagellate and we love to, you know, self deprecating and vulnerability and all, the, the whole the whole thing. But I, I feel like uh, just with this podcast, the main thing is my lane that I'm in here as far as the harm reduction movement is there's been people out there doing the work, needle exchange programs and medicated assisted treatment for people who are maybe getting onto methadone or bup or something to get off of heroin. So they're, they're doing the basically, real basically, am I getting this right? A different form of heroin that a doctor walks you down off of heroin so you can get off of it both mentally and physically. Yes. With the help of a doctor. Yes. Right. Yes. But there is controversy in the um, addiction world where you're still on heroin and right. now you're in our spaces of sobriety and you're calling yourself sober. And there's sort of like an infighting about that. Am I right? That is true. Uh, and my my response to that would kind of be like, what the fuck do you care what drugs other people are on? You know, like it's not it's not a competition in terms of are you sober? Like, are you labeling your labeling yourself that way? And what does that mean to you versus just like, are you managing your life? Are you there for the people that you love? Are you feeling better about yourself? Are you getting up every day with a purpose and doing what it is? And whatever substances are involved in that or aren't involved in that, like it's just that's kind of an, someone's own personal decision rather than. But yeah, there's plenty of controversy there, especially coming at it from this angle, which is what I kind of welcome with the show, because I think that the mainstream narrative is very much people know the 12 step programs. People know abstinence, sobriety. Uh, but, you know, harm reduction kind of, again, encompasses all of that. It's not there is not harm reduction is not 
do, do as many drugs as you want and just kind of say, you know, it's OK. It's, it is managing that use, but it's kind of meeting drug users where they're at rather than saying, here's a goal that you have to hit and you fail if you don't hit that. Is there is there truth to the idea that uh, comedians uh, do a lot of uh, drugs or drinking to get rid of demons like uh, most people and they have them because they're they're just hyper aware people, period. Yes. I, I go to the store. I, I see everything. Yep. I I hear everything. I, you know, I'll bring up something and people will be like, you were across the room. I didn't know you were listening to. It. I can't help it. I hear and see uh, everything. You think there's something to that? And that's why comedians are fucked up. I do think so. I think uh, I always liken it to the uh, you remember the old uh, John Carpenter film. They live uh, in the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a sci fi movie. So uh, with Roddy, Roddy, Roddy Piper, you put in the glasses. Uh, right. Yeah. So put on the glass. I, I view it as more like are we quoting Roddy, Roddy Piper? <laughs> like, are we, I'm sorry. Did we get too deep in political? Now we got to bring up. Roddy, yeah, right. Roddy Piper. Yes. This highly politicized of Roddy, Roddy <laughs> Piper. I think it was the kill. Uh, yeah, his, his, in this movie, the idea of put on the glasses is like I feel like comedians put on the glasses, peek behind the curtain, see how the sausage is made, whatever, whatever kind of, you know, euphemism you want to use. I think we try to look beyond just the surface level. We can't help it. We're trying to comment on shit. If you're trying to make jokes, you know, within that space or like you said, you're listening to things or we're always absorbing shit. I think like, you know, we're just we're just too damn sensitive, maybe is the is is what uh, uh, in a good way, I think uh, not even saying that in a bad way, but I think we feel shit and then we want to comment on it and, and joke about it. So to do that, I think you got to put on the glasses. And sometimes the shit you see when you got those glasses on, it's a little disturbing if you don't if you're not in a good headspace. Uh, each episode of the podcast, he continued. And Murph will share personal stories involving adolescent binge drinking and drug use, childhood sexual trauma, legal troubles, a crippling heroin habit and many other intimate moments from his past. When's the when's the first time you started drinking or doing drugs? How old? Uh, I was about 10 when I started. Oh. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Is that OK to respond like that? I mean, yeah, no, that's young. That's young. OK, I got my period at 11. OK, what are we working with here? We were this shocked a 12 year old put on a podcast. You're sitting there <laughs> 10 <laughs> years old. Your right. audience was a bunch of 10 year olds. I think from, <laughs> from, the, from the sound. of the... <laughs> Yeah, no, it's early. It's early. Uh, I started, I think, culturally, my family, a lot of, you know, there was just casual drinking. Uh, you know, all our family reunions, I come from a, a, a big family where, you know, my mom's one of nine, my dad's one of eight. So I got a shit ton of cousins and like we'd all get together and at all these events and be like, yeah, there's coolers full of beer. Yeah, if, it, if the kids are grabbing a beer, I don't know what's that kid. There's so many cousins. What, what's he 10? What's he 13? What's he 16? You know, it's just kind of like everybody's just whatever. So. Um, so, yeah, I, I started uh, smoking and drinking uh, some alcohol, sneaking here. Now, that also say to my parents, just to be fair, they were not condoning this. They weren't. My parents were not like here, have booze. I think it was just like a little bit of like a uh, the kids as they're each generation of the cousins, like gets into some shit here and there. And it wasn't really that big of a deal. But um, well, the thing is, is there's there's a lot of people who have had a first sip at 10, you know, because your parents are pretty lenient or at least they were um, or you sneak it or whatever. But most kids sort of stop because it's gross or um, get drunk for the first time and then are like, that's not because it's just you're just not ready for it. But there are people who just <laughs> as soon as I have my first sip, I'm drinking. Were you that? I was that. Yeah, I think I was that I, I enjoyed. Now, you know, you, you once I got into the liquor cabinet too, like having a beer when you're that age, you know, you could split a beer with somebody and it's a little you get a little something. But when you get into the liquor cabinet, I think that's when it was I had when that, was that beer, 10 and like, a half. That was a yeah, yeah. I I, I waited. <laughs> Did your parents months. find it weird for your eleventh birthday? You wanted like a good vodka bottle. <laughs> yes, yes, and and a shot luge. I was like, yeah, set it up on the uh, yeah for the, the no uh, no, no mommy, pin the tail on the donkey. Can I get a decanter? Can we get real? <laughs> when yeah, you say smoking, are you smoking weed at ten? No cigarettes. Cigarettes. Weed okay. came a little later. Weed was probably about thirteen. I'd say maybe. Uh, I got sold some some uh, pencil shavings or whatever the hell, some oregano. Uh -huh. That was my first experience. Yeah, Jonathan Makarevich, that son of a gun. He said he uh, uh, sold me a, like a, a joint, a pre-roll that was uh, that was not weed. Uh, so that was my first after like a middle school dance when I was about 13. But then I got did you pretend out. like did you think maybe you were high like, oh, this must be because we're such morons. You know, we're just like, I, I always feel funny. Now I get to feel funny. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if you're smoking something like, again, I don't know what the hell. I don't know if you sprayed a little WD-40 on it or I don't know what cool. the hell it was. But, you know, you get a little something you're like, oh, I'm a little lightheaded. Is this is this stoned? But yeah, th then I found out the real deal and probably started smoking weed around then.
Is there any way for them to your parents? Were they together? Your parents? Yes. Yeah. Oh, they, yeah. They separated for a little bit, but they came back together. Could they have stopped you? Like I look at my I brought up my stepkids. Uh, basically, I, you know, I'd say we're not. Yes. Stepkids. So anyway, <laughs> you follow. You follow what I'm mumbling. Uh, <laughs> it's, the real deal. it's the real. Yeah, it's the real deal. Ride so, the mumble. <laughs> right. Please, please don't politicize your family. OK, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I don't have the paperwork, but I have responsibilities. <laughs> um, you know, she would say to one of the kids, I, I, I know you smell like smoke. Don't be smoking weed. Time goes by. It's can you not do it in the house? <laughs> yes. Is there anything parents could do? I think no. And I honestly I feel like this is uh, this might be like shitty to say if for your young, young, young audience that's listening. But like, I, yeah, I think that you you got I think the communication's got to be there. I think that the support, the communication and the information, because like, I don't know if you got when you guys were growing up, the dare we were like the dare uh, generation. Yeah. So so there was the scare tactics, the kind of shit that for at least me, my personality, I saw Officer Dan coming in with, you know, to, with, with, with this like uh, briefcase full of all these little fun, crazy little uh, trinkets of like, well, this is a little, you know, uh, this is a zoomer and this is a, you know, a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a Thai weed stick. And this is this shit. And I'm like looking at this stuff and it's like, as soon as this guy turns his back, I feel like half the class <laughs> would want to at least like grab a little something and be like, right. cause that's just how kids are. You know, you tell them don't, don't do shit. So I think that being honest, it's like the moment you find out Santa Claus is fake, then you're just like, well, you know, what the hell else are you lying about? So I think that the scare tactics, when you get old enough to realize that a lot of the reefer madness style, upbringing it once you think that's bullshit and you realize that's bullshit it's like be honest with kids tell them you know there's there's too much of any th thing is not good and but here's you know the, the the differences between these drugs if you smoke a joint you're not gonna you know your genitals aren't going to explode or whatever the dare propaganda was oh what drug did you do that exploded your balls <laughs> yeah <laughs> just the bomb that's a new one yeah where would you get money for weed as a kid uh, so we pull our resources, uh, did a little landscaping. I picked some strawberries at O'Malley's farm. You had a couple, you know, side gigs and even, yeah, parents giving you a couple bucks here and there. Shit was cheap. Uh, like when we were growing up, you know, you throw in on, on something or someone would steal a little bit of something from the liquor cabinet or some people's parents smoked weed. Pinch I know Kyle's part of some, uh, you know, frustrated parents, Facebook group. And, you know, somebody goes, I don't tolerate my kids doing drugs. And she's like, well, I don't tolerate it either. Yeah, right. It happens. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's always parents want to put it on them. Yeah, exactly. You're like, that, that's not something most people uh, would, would, would tolerate. But yeah, I think just being honest in communication, which I don't have kids, so it's easy. It's easy for me to say my right, dog right. does not get high every day. So <laughs> wow, good job. Yeah, I don't tolerate it. <laughs> <laughs> and when do you start doing harder drugs, acid, heroin? Probably uh, that was high school. That was about, uh, I'd say, 16, 15, 16, getting into high school age. Uh, I also got uh, arrested for uh, there's a criminal trespass underage drinking thing. So I got put on probation and I failed a, a drug test for marijuana. Uh, so then I was on probation my senior year of high school for about six months. What uh, is this? You broke into like a abandoned building or something? We were in the woods. We were at a party and the property lines got blurred. You know, it was like out in the sticks of Pennsylvania. So there's right. there, someone's parents had like a cabin or whatever the hell. And we got onto someone else's property and they called the state police and it was all there wasn't. You know, it was just the shenanigans on that end. But uh, yeah, once I, we got busted, uh, there was a, a yeah, I had to I was on probation. So my P.O. would come into school randomly whenever and I'd mm -hmm. piss in a cup and he'd standing over, he's like a six foot eight, like 300 pound dude, just standing over my shoulder being like, all right, now urinate in this cup and I'm going to test your, your urine. So the first one I did, I failed for marijuana because he did not tell me I've had other friends who've been through the same process. And they were like, oh yeah, usually the PO will say to a kid, cause you know, you're just, you're, you're underage, you're starting out. You're like, all right, you're in some shit here. But if you tell me that you have used marijuana before we start, I'll now have a baseline. And then I'll expect this first one to say that you smoked some weed maybe, but each time I come back, I want the levels to go down until you're, you know, there's there's no longer any drugs. My dude didn't tell me that at all. And of course, you're not just going to offer that up to a, an officer of the court coming in. Right. And be like, yeah. Hey, man, just so you know, I smoke a lot of weed. Uh, <laughs> so I kind of, you know, I failed that first test and I got hauled off to the to the uh, uh, Luzerne County to Juvenile Detention Center. Uh, and so that period, I knew I couldn't smoke any weed. So that's when I did a lot of acid when I was in uh, high school because they couldn't test. There's no urine test for acid. So on the weekends. My friends would come into my folks' basement. We do a lot of acid. Did you do time for that? Did you? Were you in? Uh, just I was only until my. Uh, uh, I was in there for only a week until my next until the hearing came up that I went in front of the judge and then I got a longer probation. I was on a longer period. At first, it was only three months and then it went to six months. Did you get to see what juvie was like at all, or is it just a holding cell? 
No, we were, it was in the, it was in the, the detention center. Another fun caveat is we just watched like, you know, the kids there. I was old. I was almost 18. I was only like two months to my 18th birthday. So it's a lot of younger kids, 15, 16. I was one of the older kids in there and it was, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it's shitty conditions. We we got to watch a movie, uh, on Friday nights. Uh, actually every night we got to watch a movie on Friday nights. We got to watch two. We watched new Jack city always was like the hmm. one that we always wanted to watch, which was a fun one to watch in the, in juvie. Um, but yeah, the judge I went in front of what was funny is uh, his name is Mark Shivarella and he's a Luzerne County uh, a juvenile judge was. And I don't know if you heard about this kids for cash scandal thing that happened a little while back. It like made kind of. Oh, mad. it sounds <laughs> political. Yes. We're going to get political at this. Yeah. Uh, mm. I think this could be a bipartisan thing, like yeah. a, no, a no from across the board, maybe. I don't know. Um, but this dude was selling kids. They set up a they built a private juvenile detention center uh, for profit prison. Yeah. And he was sending kids away for like minor vandalism stuff everything and getting kickbacks so he got like almost three million dollars in kickbacks over but they didn't start doing this until like a year or less after i went in front of him so i i just missed the boat on getting sent away for for quite some time so there's a lot of kids there were thousands of kids who ended up getting like locked up for the smallest shit possible and he got eventually that, that whole ring got busted up but yeah, that was I like that we ever. gave it a cute name, though. Kids for cash. Yeah. Yeah. It's like one, seven, one seven, seven, cars for cash. For cash. Yeah. <laughs> the kids end up worse from uh, juvenile detention centers. Yes. Yeah. I think that that punitive, uh, especially when it comes to drug things or just like childhood shenanigans, you know, it's like the little stuff. It's like there's, you know, the, whatever vandalized things or you skip truant from school or things where it's like kids might be having a fucking rough time at that age, you know, and it's it, going in there is not. There's nothing rehabilitative about about that. And, and, and that's on a small level of the juvenile. I mean, you know, even not even to mention the, you know, the the the, the larger uh, prison industrial thing that we got going on here uh, for profit. But, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think it's rehabilitative at all. I think I think it kind of puts people in like a bad headspace. It put me I went I certainly went beyond that uh, even further in, into, you know, so I didn't learn. My takeaway from that was even before I knew this, this judge was was selling kids up the river. Uh, even before that, I kind of just getting a peek at the system. It was like, yeah, this is this is predatory. Do um, what was the childhood sexual trauma? So that was uh, when I was 11. Uh, I had a uh, um, uh, she was a former blackjack dealer. She was in her mid to, uh, mid to late 40s. And she was uh, she would buy all the kids in the neighborhood beer, but mostly high school age kids or whatever, I kind of ran with a little bit of an older crowd. So I was a tag along in a situation where she bought us some beer. We're asking her to buy a cigarette. She got his beer. And then there was a, uh, she ended up uh, uh, jerking off me and a, and a kid older than me at the same time together. Uh, and I had not been drinking. I was, this is 11 years old. So I'd not been drinking that long. So I didn't have much of a tolerance. I kind of had to pee, but I didn't want to disturb the uh, proceedings or whatever. So I thought right. I actually finally jizzed at the end when in fact it was just a beer piss that I let rip all over the room. <laughs> which my friend then told me later. Oh. Yeah, because I was like, I finally jizz because, you know, I was 11. I'm like, I had a little bit of fuzz, but I didn't quite know how to, you know, I'm flicking it around, hitting it on the couch. Cause I didn't really know how to get it done. Uh, There's a so lot I of hitting it on the couch or against <laughs> things, which I, I, I'm finding. This is, by the way, before the Internet, where you can go, uh, yes. should I hit my dick on the couch? <laughs> nope, it was all trial and error. And then oh, those boy. Days. Yeah. Oh, wow. How do you how do you wake up to that being a trauma and that you were taken advantage of other than, you know, instead of being fucking awesome. Yeah, that's dude. That's a great, that is a great question because for years I kind of framed it as some sort of like just wildly, like it, it, disturbingly inaccurate, like Mrs. Robinson, you know, the graduate mm. type scenario. I was like, yeah, I was young. And there was, so it took me a little while uh, until I actually started kind of doing this bit as a longer form story and actually audiences mm. feedback and kind of, you know, cause I hadn't talked to a lot about even with my family and like friends, like the way I'd kind of frame it. And then people, you know, people out of the side, they're like, wait a minute, did, was he, how old was he? In that? Like 11, what, did he say he was 11 years old? So people start, I started to get the sense of that, which I think is good to work through things when you're doing a bit. It's like, you gotta, you gotta be over it yourself. You gotta be okay with it yourself to kind of even, cause it's a very, you know, certainly a sensitive subject. I I'm of the mind that nothing is off limits to joke about, especially when it's your own personal experiences. But like, you know, that's one that, that it took me, you know, there were gasps in, in, in live audiences and then there was feedback and there's but I've I've slowly kind of found a little bit of the, the humor in it through that and worked through it. But I think it's important to, to actually put a point on it. I will even do that right now because didn't really do the whole context of the bit. But yes, that was a predatory completely. That's child most like that. That 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 woman is, you know, she's burning in hell, I imagine somewhere. Uh, she said she was an ex Hollywood actress who lost all her 
money playing high stakes mahjong tournaments in atlantic city she had this whole yarn she spun for all the the neighborhood kids to be like yo you know she's like a hollywood actress and shit i'm like dude mm. what movies like we we can well, there's no internet now but we can watch like right. what movies is this woman <laughs> right and in uh Right. And we all know the three actors in Hollywood right now. Yes. Yep. Yeah. This, ain't, this is not Susan Sarandon. Uh, <laughs> what, so yeah. the, what when she was doing that, is it only about power? Because she's not necessarily touching herself, it sounds like. Right. It's just look what I can do for you. I think so. Yeah. And I think also, like I said, too, I was kind of a tag along. And this, again, is not an apologist at all, even for the kid, dudes who are 16, you know, 17. It's still predatory. These are, you know, you're at the down at the basketball courts at the park, at the pool hall, whatever she's lingering around knowing kids want booze and so she was absolutely predatory so she would some of the stuff i heard from the older kids that went on was far more than graphic and i didn't know what yeah. that could make heads or tails of it at the time but whatever i mean i'm i'm 45 years old i'm not interested in anything you're saying about this i'm not yeah. interested in buying underage beer for anybody no i don't want to even hang out with them am i babysitting yeah that's oh, she definitely was, yeah, yeah. It's a it's she, yeah, she was a full on predator. She was. And I think the other thing is with the with the the gender side of it, too, is it's, it was easier for me going through all this to kind of frame it in a way. And I think this was for my own pr protection a little. Uh, people ask me a lot of times, too, that I, do I think that's the main contributor to kind of the substitute. I think it is part of it, but at least just for me personally, it wasn't it, once I brought it to light. It kind of like it was there was some unpacking of trauma. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Um but yeah, I don't think that that's necessarily the main reason that I, you know, went on to be using heroin or whatever. But that's, you know, impossible to to, to pinpoint. That's from is there point. any way that, you know, uh, you treated sex or relationships different because of that moment? What's anything stand out like, you know, uh, son, let's talk about the birds and the bees. I'm like, I know it's not pee. <laughs> yes. What? Yes. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what's I'm like, at what point do the bird do the birds piss to the bees? But who's pissing here? <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, no, it was, uh, not really. I don't think, I think it kind of jaded me just kind of around the, you know, just the, the whole kind of thing. Like I felt like when I was in high school, there was a lot of dirt bags and this is also generally more of a, was it certainly a dude thing where there'd be like girls in my grade when we were like freshmen or sophomores, like, oh, I'm dating this guy who's like, he's cool. He's like 23 and he has his own apartment where I'm like, this seems so now, you know, at that time I wasn't maybe framing it as like, well, I don't know. It's all, you know, there's a lot of people doing whatever that, you know, but I didn't think of it in, in those terms. I thought those girls were cool. And and I I had this friend of a friend actually in high school and I was uh, listening to her tell my friend like she skipped, she skipped school yesterday and was hanging out and we're in high school. Uh, she met these guys and they went back to their place and like, you know, somebody jerked somebody off or whatever the fuck, like that kind of uh hand stuff or something. I mean, as far as I remember. Um, and I was like, whoa, 20 somethings are interested in talking to us. Like that was like, like she is so cool. Like she must have like been the coolest, wearing the coolest and saying like, I wouldn't even know how to like catch these guys interest. And now I'm just like, oh my God. Yeah. Holy well, when you look shit. at what that dude situation was, cause you're like not putting down Maybe they were, you know, so I don't know who these these young girls are talking about. Maybe they were very cool. But also you look at the other side and like, oh, this dude's a fucking huge loser, most oh, yeah. likely. And a predatory asshole who's like, I can't talk to many human beings so I can just like I've got a Camaro and I can drive and I can get booze. So that makes right. me like, like the king of the castle here. And also, if she was supposed to be in school, he was supposed to be at work. Yeah. Yes. So it's yes. Yes. What and his mom doing? was screaming that at him when right. she was in the basement nonstop. Oh. She's like, go to work. Stop going. You're not going back to high school. You'll never get your GED. He's like, no, but I got to pick up my girl. How old were you when you started heroin? Uh, that was uh, I snorted it for the first time. Uh, I was in high school. We thought wow. it was. Uh, yeah, we thought it was uh, ecstasy. It was supposed to be like a crushed up ecstasy pill. Found out later that it was actually some heroin. Um, but then full on doing it myself, 18, 18 was that was when I really got in uh, fully. And I didn't really wait long uh, either to start shooting it. Uh, I never really had like a thing with needles. I knew that was obviously the one where you get the biggest rush, but that's kind of where you you certainly can get addicted to just snorting. Uh, but do you have our marks? Uh, no, I actually I have. I, they kind of went away. I never had any abscesses. Uh, I got hepatitis C from sharing needles, mm. uh, but I never got any like uh, real bad abscesses that didn't heal or whatever. So like I have like maybe a little tiny dots here. I don't know how. Let's test this 4K Logitech camera that I got hooked up here. I don't know. Logitech will be very happy about the <laughs> yeah. mention. Yeah, right. There's a plug for you. It picks up your track marks. It's so good. 
So when does it hit you like, hey, I got to stop doing heroin. It, this is the one I have a problem with. I think there was a I was getting kind of uh, involved into a lot of the because uh, at first I was kind of selling to support my own habits. So it was like, you know, violating the number one rule of the, you know, don't get high in your own supply. I got high on my entire supply. Uh, so but I built up a habit with that because I was able to always at least have enough around. And then once that were you selling when you say on supply, you were selling. Yeah, yeah. We were okay. making runs. So in where I'm at in, in Pennsylvania, it's about an hour and a half run to Philly. So we had a connection there that was very cheap and coming back here. And it was like mainly just, you know, we were the, the me and a couple of other people had like a little bit of an operation, but it was mostly we were all also just using. So there was no there was no like money being made. It was all just like, oh, we can build up a habit uh, for ourselves. And then that kind of built to a point where once a few people got arrested and that ring was kind of broken up a little. Uh, I, then you get to the point where like, holy shit, I have like a 10 bag a day habit and now I have no money and, you know, no jobs. And it's how like, much is heroin? Well, uh, here, th this is also now going back into the early 2000s. Obviously I'm very for, cool for because my question is, excuse me. Um, what are the just one heroin please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Usually uh, we were able to get it kind of like the, the way it was packaged uh, the, back then at least was we could sell it here for like 25 bucks a bag. And you could buy it there uh, in Philly. We were getting it for like once we were buying in bulk, we were getting it down to like six dollars a bag. So, you and know, how much high is a bag? Uh, usually, like if you're, you know, just starting out, like you should maybe only shoot up like half a bag. But like I was up to again, like I said, like a 10 bag, 12 bag a day habit. So, you know, you work up. You're always got to keep uh, up in the dose. Just like Starbucks. I get it. It is it, totally, yeah. totally one Starbucks and one heroin. <laughs> Once you they have write the your app. name, they write your little name. They misspell your name on the fucking bag of heroin. Of course. <laughs> and now you start realizing you're doing it too much. You don't have money. Is that what got you? off? Yeah. Of? Yeah. Some some uh, petty crime kind of stuff gets in and you just start realizing just you just get tired, man. It's like a full time job. It's like every morning you're up at the crack of dawn, like trying to figure out what if you're not shooting up, you're doing prep work to get your next fix. It's always it's just a nonstop thing. You get isolated. I think the number one thing I kind of learned just about addiction in general is just how isolating, like how it becomes like, at least in the group I was friends I was in, it's like we pushed it pretty far. So you had to get to a point where it was like people started to realize good friends of mine. It's like, yeah, we've all done like a lot of drugs and we like to party. But like there is this last level that like some of us went to. Unfortunately, I was at least able to come back from. Um, but I, I think that like that you realize that and family start lying to everybody. You know, it's just a very you just turn it in, inward and it's like I, I missed my family. I missed my friends. I was like, I'm just tired of this. So I, I, I went home and I was lucky to have a family that was still just like you pawned our shit. You fucking took our computer. Like we're still here for you to support you when you're ready. Is that what Did you it? mean when you say petty crime? Uh, well, that was a that was the the least of the petty. Yeah, there, we we did some some uh, yeah some armed robbery. We used to like to go into oh. rich neighborhoods. We were the we were the yeah yeah we got. How's it called? Some, petty crime. <laughs> done. Because the they were being petty. real petty about it. Dude, yeah. the judges around here were doing a lot worse crimes than we were doing. That's <laughs> oh. how I that's how I frame it. Uh, <laughs> no, that's not petty. Yeah, that's a more than petty. Uh, but yes, well, there, were, there were some uh, some some things we would get into. Just like you know, whatever. tell me tell me about a time that sticks out. So you 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 it's two of you with guns. Uh, uh, yes, it was two of us. It was uh, three. There was three of us in, in, in a group that I that I ran with for uh, for a little while. Um, and yeah, we, we just we did a couple of stick ups. But a lot of them was uh, one of our uh, 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 an acquaintance that we knew for a long time. She lived up in this uh, these estates. I'm not going to start naming names of things now to get too specific. I don't know what sure. the hell. The, uh, the, you know, the, the 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 time. What's that called when it's allegedly statement? allegedly? Yes, we'll just call this show allegedly. Oh, this ahead. one is allegedly. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, you know, where, where the where the developments are and it's the fancy houses and stuff. So we you know, we we were like we're the Robin Hoods of, you know, because in my neighborhood and my you know friends and family in this area, you know, it's working class. It's a lot of people don't have much. So it's not we kind of were like, we're going to go up to the to the estates to the you know, to, to be able to right. break into those houses. And this woman would be like, these people are on vacation or this person is this. And I know the alarm code because me and this girl and they would, you know, sell out all of their friends and their whatever to to do things. So we were getting into those kind of activities. Uh, and it's just like, yeah, I mean, that's just not. That's just not who I am, even though I can frame it as like a Robin Hood scenario. Like, that's just not I, it. Just, you know, it doesn't feel good. It, it, it's a terrible thing. And you realize this is a compulsion and this is a problem. And I, I like I said, I was very lucky to have a, a strong support system of friends and family. Not everyone has that who are willing to be like, yo, man, you're, you're ready for help. You want to do it like we're going to give you nothing but love and support. So that at what cool. age did you stop here on? Twenty two, like twenty okay. ten, a little up to twenty two. So it's a decent amount of heroin time. Yeah, it was to a day stay alive. 
Yeah. Yeah. It was a, and to stay out of jail. Like, again, I had mm. the juvenile brush, but like the war on drug stuff too, man, that's the kind of shit where it's like, once you're in that thing, cause you still, you still can have access to as many, as many drugs as you want while you're in prison, as everyone knows, like they make their way in there. So you don't, there's no treatment there. You're just kind of thrown in the, in the, uh, in the sober tank of like, well, you go through withdrawals in those first, like for which those are brutal. So you go through that in a cell alone with no medication, with no whatever. And then, you know, you get out and it's like, what, you know, what do you do to, to get your fix as you're, as you're in there? So I think that the punitive nature, one of the big things of harm reduction as well is ending the drug war. Like it's just such a costly thing, wherever you fall on it, you might think, Oh, it doesn't affect me or I don't do drugs or someone immediately. I don't know, but it's like, it just costs all of us like so much just, you know, of from society, but also even just money, just money. It also hasn't proven to help. No, I mean, in, it, no. yeah, if you if you want to show proof that that helps, then I think we'd be able to get to be on board. But I don't I don't understand if if doctors are saying that this is not how to treat people, you know, um, and you, you got to treat them like they are diseased. So I don't know what we're doing. Yeah. But no, yeah. You're... You know, I, I get like you should pay for your crime like you really scared the shit out of people when they come home. They feel a certain way when you're sticking them up. You've changed their existence and people want you to pay for that. So then we go into what is paying for that, you know, and, and when will it be right? And what's the what's the punishment for it? But in addition to that, you have to see um, how will this help the rest of the our lives together? Yep. Is there anything you have or can do to make up for being a piece of shit so many years ago other than just treating yourself right? Or, hey, what's you're sorry, but what's done is done. Yeah, I think. Well, I I think that there's, uh, you know, with people that I know personally, like I said, fr friends and family that, that I kind of put through a, a hell of a time, uh, uh, you know, ma making I've had a lot of conversations, even doing this project kind of dug up a lot of old stuff in the, in the beginning. And, you know, with just even with my immediate family uh of that idea of like well if you're going to be publicly this is to help people and this is to you know to help lift stigma and all that so but i had to have those conversations uh in terms of society i think uh yeah i, I feel like a lot of that uh goes back to like medicated assisted treatment so there were no methadone clinics there were no so there's also like this it's like if you if you cut that off at the before people get to the desperate point of like one they're either going to go to jail like obviously you know uh, holding someone up for any reason whether it's those are crimes of desperation. So those generally speak to whether you're looking to get drugs or whether you're looking to, you know, pay, pay your rent or, or, or whatever it is. Most people don't get into, unless you're talking about your, you know, your, your uh, oceans 11 scenarios where it's like, let's go big. Most of that shit is crimes of desperation. Those, those, those happen in areas where people's basic material conditions aren't being met for generations. And for a long enough time, they feel trapped. Like, and that just kind of is what it is. So I'd say it's a little bit bigger of an issue than just like, should someone go to jail if they were, addicted to drugs and they committed a crime or should they go to, a tr to treatment and, and, and look at that versus like, just why is that happening in the, in the first place? Cause like you said, we have a 50 year sampling here on the, like, let's shoot these drugs with bazookas and throw everyone in jail who does them. And that shit just clearly doesn't work. Uh, would, it's gotten worse. Would, would friends or family be nervous that you do other drugs? If you stole my TV set and I see you do Coke and, and I go, Marf, you motherfucker. And you're like, no, Coke's not the problem. Yes, your TV set's fine when I'm on Coke. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, I, that's a fair. I've had many, and I also have a lot of, you know, like I said, my family's uh, a lot of mix of functioning alcoholics versus people who've been in, in, in AA and, and NA and those programs. So I had a lot of conversations at first with people who'd be like, well, wait, no, you're not like sober. Like if you do any, you know, drugs or any, anything out after using heroin, you're just going to go right back to using heroin. So, you know, my family's a lot of, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, battles, battle things out. And then there's like hugs at the end of the night. But I'm like, we're also all having this conversation like drunk. And it's like then then out in the early stages, family I'm hugs, we Keep, do hug. But they're those up? like they're those like fucking, hug. you know, it's like, ah, oh, you son of a bitch kind of hug. It's, not like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, let me get my paws on you. It's that kind of thing. Right. Um, but yes, to answer your thing. Yes, I think that there was a lot of that at first. But I guess for me, I was like, I need to prove myself to be like, Again, what 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 for me do I need to be there for people? And I have been. I wasn't for a long time with people in my family. And they're like, well, now you are, you know, making a career for yourself. You're you know, you've met a wonderful uh, woman and you, you, you've you been to these family functions and you don't you're not just like a soulless husk who's like showing up like all the time. Like it's it. And I think they saw that and eventually, you know, came around. But, yeah, the first th uh, thing is like, wait a minute. 
one sip of beer. Like, no, you'll be right back on heroin. Also, not everybody has to forgive you. The end. No, no, like, absolutely. it's just yep. you could live in all the amends that you want and you can do all the right things. But you did something where somebody just wants to stay in that place with you. You never have to be friends. And they don't want to hear you say any of the nice things that are happening in your life. And You're absolutely right. And that's fine. Next. Yep. Agreed. I agree. If you didn't do drugs, would you go nuts? Yes. Yes. Uh, I think that's where I found my what sort of drugs like and what kind of helps me a little bit with the booze of taking the edge off. But yes, I would be a crazy person. I, uh, what kind I, of crazy person? Angry. I think rage. I think one of the big things for me was like we talk about put on the glasses. I feel like uh, now we are going to maybe get a little political. But when I was young and kind of seeing the the power structures as they are and as they like it was just it's, it makes me really angry. So I think there's a lot of rage. Like, and I, and I, from a very people who I tell that and they're like, well, you're like a pretty fucking chill, fun time, Charlie guy. Like, what, what do you mean? rage? But I think it was like rage that then goes to sadness and it's like that kind of cycle. But yeah, I think I'd be a crazy person where I would be like ranting and raving about the ills of everything. Like all the time, I think uh, if I didn't uh, self-medicate. Is it boredom also, or just anger? Uh, I think a little bit, I think a little bit of both. I think when I was younger boredom, now I have a little bit more of a driven kind of focus do, doing things that fill in my life with stuff that I am passionate about. And I do give a shit about, and I'm again, trying to help people with lifting Sigma. Like I, I do shows, I tell, you know, stories and people come up to me afterwards. And there's always that thing of, was that like a joke or was that like a real thing? Cause my brother, my sister, my, my, my mother, father, son, whatever, uh, is kind of going through something and it's, it, so like, I feel like that has a little bit of a purpose uh, and gives me some purpose. So, but when I was young, bored and big time, yeah. Like you, yeah. you're sitting around, there's no, there's no jobs. There's no nothing. You're like, well, I'm just going to fucking get high all day. Did you ever end up having a sex where you ejaculate the proper way? Um, yes. So okay. you shit. what you do is you, you don't piss. You shit. <laughs> oh, no, Murph. Oh, <laughs> yeah. No. It's a number two is not a number one. No, I, I finally figured out a way to, to get it done. Yes. <laughs> What uh, um so when when they say the harm reduction movement, mm -hmm. it, it seems like a big term for just do drugs when you want and don't worry what society's telling you. Right. Yeah, no, you're right. So so harm reduction just as like a as like more of the clinical definition of like the practices of harm reduction, which some of those are like wearing a seatbelt is like a form of harm reduction. Like if you're going to be driving, like making it safer by wearing a seatbelt. Condoms is another big one that during the AIDS, you know, the height of the AIDS epidemic, when the you know, the more religious people were like, no, that that'll make kids want to have sex more. Like, nope, they're going to have all the sex. By the way, you guys were wrong about us wanting to have more sex because of condoms. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. You <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Almost right. Yeah. You're like, if you want to have less and less sex, put these uh, fucking like these, late, these latex little fucking things that are impossible to rip the goddamn thing. Out. Yeah. I feel like such an asshole. Oh, nope. totally. I, knew a, I knew a guy in school that put the balls in the condom because nobody taught him. Oh. <laughs> Oh, that that's like what What was the thing like the banana was supposed to be the thing. he put the peel yeah. and the banana and everything into the yeah oh man that, that probably didn't work out oh, <laughs> oh, I, I, they should say that in the nurse's room right like uh, we put the put the grapes to the side <laughs> yes and this covers your right. banana oh this god i'm just picturing all, him right? taking it off and it holds on to everything yeah oh god yeah <laughs> also if you don't have a magnum like i mean you you don't have much wiggle room inside that oh. those condoms. it'd be like just a big ball of shit <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like a balloon animal at that point yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh jesus uh yeah so those are those are all forms of like and again i say needle exchange <laughs> uh programs are again like a thing where it's like people are gonna do the stuff so like as far as public health is concerned, why have limitations uh, based on some holdover of like, well, if you don't have a prescription for a syringe, like you can't possess one or that's like a thing you could arrest someone just for having a syringe. Like these things. Well, how, how can you tell on a personal level what your harm reduction would be? You know, because we're talking about um, I, I think everybody's an addict, but we're talking about either active addicts or recovering addicts. So yeah. people who are in that realm where their thing is going to the extreme. So how do you know what's your harm reduction? Because you're doing it from yourself, right? Like you're not, yes. this isn't, uh, there's no guru, there's no medicine man, there's no nothing. You're guessing essentially and yep. medicating yourself. How do you, yes. how can one do that? Yeah, I, th I think there's a lot, there's definitely a lot of uh, self-reflection uh, with that. Um, so I think that that's what makes it kind of unique is like saying meeting drug users where they're at is like you're, you're there for support in whatever way. But yeah, sometimes it takes people time. You know, sometimes people think 
Well, I can, cause you know, as, as, as sometimes with an addict's brain, at least, and again, this is all speaking from my experiences, we lie to ourselves. We tell ourselves, oh, well, I, I can do this or I can manage that or, but I think, yeah, I think, I think once there's not this, like there's, you kind of lift this, the, the, the dogma of something, which I've never done well with, like in any medium. So like this idea of like, it's gotta be this thing. Like, I just, I feel the freedom to be able to do a little self-reflection and, and it kind of like worked for me. And again, like I said before, if your harm reduction is literally, if you show up and say, I want to be abstinent, I want to go completely cold Turkey right now. And that's, that's what I know about myself. I can't have one drink or whatever, then, then there, that the support is there for that. Like harm reduction is not like do some drugs. Like it's to do, it's whatever you think will work for you, which is hard to figure out. Are are you um into anonymous meetings? I don't know if I could ask or if it's um, a bad no, idea. I didn't. It didn't. When I first started, I was I went to some NA stuff. It didn't. It didn't really. Uh, it didn't work for me. Uh, so, but again, that for each person to each their own. So it's it's like that's uh, that's not something that I do. But also, if I showed up there, you know, and I'm just with a beer, you know, I think <laughs> that, you know, that might be that might be an issue. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that there is a clash. And what it's I'm your turn to talk in an NA meeting and you're like, so I'm really cutting down. Yep. I'm a former heroin addict, current alcoholic. <laughs> Only weekends. Uh, uh, you guys seem to be moaning a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting some eyes here. I don't need to. You can take the token. I know I don't get any of the token. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to take a token. Uh, yeah, it no, does I- suck because um, we do, at least in this country, it seems like there's one method of getting off of whatever you're addicted to. And that's the 12 step program, which I, I think it helps a lot. I, people have heard that there's a lot of benefit to it. There's, it's so much good writing and, and, and how to reflect all the stuff. Good, 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 good. Yep. But I understand that it's not fair that um, that's the only option where a judge can say, you can go to this 12 step program for this amount of weeks and that will work for you. It's a shame because I do think 12 steps work that the, the program, A, Alan, on all of those community, anonymous, community it, aspects to it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Community aspects to it. But it's weird that we haven't come up with like, and also this, or maybe that it's weird that it is an all or nothing thing, which seems to be what works for a lot of people. But I think you have to, they talk about like the gift of desperation. It seems you really have to have this level of desperation. Um, at least for me, I went, I went in there. The more you feel desperate, it seems uh, from my perspective, the more I felt desperate, the more I can release into this program and then um, take the steps because I really literally don't know what the next step is. But I do think there are other ways, but it's other therapeutic ways. You have to talk to other people. You have to have community. If you can find ways of doing those two things, but a, you know, a judge can't go like you have to talk to friends, you know, um, but maybe therapists. Yep. Or, or a second opinion. Like even if we're just even thinking of it in medical context, it's like, you know, and <clears throat> this is another thing where I don't ever, and I've had these conversations with people who's friends of mine who have worked the, the, the 12 step programs and, and, and it, they definitely worked for them. It's interesting to me though, when you look at like for how many years we've been treating that, I mean, whenever the, the first book, you know, that was in the thirties the or, you know, whenever, however long ago that was, you're looking at this one way of treating something where, you know, they won't publish because of course it's anonymous. And also that's a hard thing to quantify, but the success rate of what it is, there's been some uh, analysis and look into that over the last like 10 years or so that suggests it's at the highest 10 to 15 percent mm-hmm. success rate of being like you would whatever. So to me, that would almost be like what other you know treatment would be offered for cancer if you were like, well, the best cancer treatment and the only one that is like the, the mandatory treatment for this cancer works about 15 percent of the time. Again, you would just say, but see that that might be one. all we have for the harm reduction of that cancer right now. Right. I just, you know if another scientist can work on some other way, uh, I'm hoping we're working on several ways to get this done. But if the, if that's all there is for cancer right now, I guess the the judge would go, why don't you yeah. go do that? Which is why I also don't love to get too like caught up in the judgment. Cause as you know, we're fellow, like we're both, you know, have had, I'm so talking to you, but any of us out there who have gone through this, it's like we should have solidarity with each other. There shouldn't be this judgment of like, well, you did it this way and that might not work or you did that. Like, I think we need more more of the community and more of having each other's backs to be like, whatever it is, 
that you know you're doing for yourself that you're trying to get better and if that is working for you i think to, to use the cancer analogy the main thing i think we should all be fighting for is to end the drug war because to use that cancer analogy it also means cancer is also illegal and if you get caught with a whiff of any sort of cancer you go to jail so i'm like those are most of the harms caused by drug use mm -hmm. are are very much because of the punitive nature of just one and done and and there's people in jail there's weed legal in some states completely now and there's people that are still serving decades long sentences for weed so see i wanted you to get there so that we can make sure this was a political issue thank <laughs> you for talking about your heroin addiction in a way that we can put down the government and really show what hell side yeah. we're on hell yes do you have do you people. have friends that would find that would that would hear like be happy be pleased like oh i like this idea okay i won't i don't have to do so much coke and i can do this instead and you want to be like no you need to quit <laughs> you know i bummed out a lot of people when i quit drinking because they're like well i always drink with keith and if he has a problem then obviously i might have <laughs> yeah no there's a yeah there's a lot of like no no i'm the special one listen you <laughs> do that yeah no i think yeah I, I think like when people have come to me the other problem is, too, is like uh, like what Hemda was saying about uh, about just access to treatment. Like, I feel like like when a judge is going to say, well, this is the one way to do it or this is like like I feel like just access. I think giving people like and it's all been mutual aid, like a lot of the harm reduction community and the harm reduction movement is big on ending the war on drugs because of the, the racist aspects of what that has done. The, the, the sentencing disparity between crack and cocaine like that, you know, that that was a whole that still is, is a problem uh, that was uh, the architect of that is now has the power to maybe stop that. Let's see if he does. Uh, um, but yeah, I, I think that like a lot of those issues that, that people are fighting for in the harm reduction movement is just like access to treatment too. It's like, there's just like giving people the options to say, let's like people, feel, if you don't change people's material conditions, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know what it worked for, for you guys, but at least for me, like I was lucky enough to have friends and family have, have a place to go to, to be able to reset and start from that. And be like, I'm going to try to be better. But I'm like, if you're if you don't change people's material conditions, if that shit's not gonna, like, what are you trying to what, what's the where's the light at the end of the tunnel? You know, you got to put some kind of light and some kind of support, which is what I agree that is great about some of the 12 step programs is that community, that accountability. Certain people love that, like that works very well. And having that like checking in with people and, and the support of that, like, I think that's the most beautiful parts of the of those types of programs. Um, but I think that can be all encompassing. It doesn't have to be like an all or nothing scenario. How do you know that you're on the right track? How do you know you're not doing a drug too much? Do you realize I'm no longer like I would think about drinking? I realized I'd think about drinking almost in the morning. Like I didn't need to drink then, but I knew it's coming as a reward. Does that leave your brain and you know you're good? It does a little bit. And I'll also say that, like, one, these are fucking terrible. So cigarettes, smoking, cigarettes. I, yes, the, the uh, uh, that's not. Uh, so I, I try to cut back also with my liver. Like I said, I had hepatitis C. I was I got the treatment and I it actually it did work for me. So the hepatitis C is gone, but still my liver has been kind of through. So whenever I say like, oh, I'm a functioning alcoholic, I'm like my liver would probably disagree with that. Right. To cut back a little bit. So I I do go through periods where I know I'm drinking too much, uh, but I, just my makeup doesn't like I don't drink too much and then get violent or go out and do, you know, I'm just I'm still like a very even keel. Like, you know, Diana has mentioned this to me, friends, other people have mentioned like the area I come from, like we're vi we can drink a lot and not really seem drunk which is not like a, <laughs> isn't that cool? That's just kind of like the way we are. So that, that lends itself almost to like more long-term shit. I got a lot of people in my family, you get into the cirrhosis, you get into the, just the, the wet brain. Like it's not that immediate, like, holy shit, my life is careened out of control kind of drinking. That's one, you know, happens to some people, whereas it's more just like a slow burn. That, so like, you slow burning? I'm slow burning and hmm. I know it and I'm almost 40. So I am going to, my next chapter is certainly looking to drink less than what I am now. It's not like I'm like, hey, man, I'm not shooting up every day and stealing your TV. Like, give me a pat on the back. Like, I know for my own personal journey, like I, I do have to look at those things and, and smoking. I go on little spurts, but I've, I've cut back on that tremendous. I used to smoke two packs a day. So that I know is like not sustainable and terrible. Um, but yeah, just every day trying to do a little bit less harm to myself and like be there again, be there for other people. When I know I'm not doing that, then I know I have to kind of check myself. Like, dude, you're getting too fucked up here. You're you're a little erratic. You're not you're missing responsibilities or you're not there emotionally for people. Just that, that you know, that kind of thing, that kind of stuff. Well, the podcast is called uh, Self-Medicated with Murph Meyer. You can subscribe now. It'll start uh, coming out next week. Uh, the Twitter account is at Murph Medicated. And I just saw you and your wife were on. Uh, this is some time ago, but I just saw it. Uh, the Price is Right set. 
by the giant <laughs> wheel. <laughs> yes, we had a little time with uh, Drew Carey. There. And uh, she spins the wheel. There's a cardboard, you know, giant c- cardboard cut out of uh, Drew Carey. She yeah. spins the wheel. She's very pleased with uh, with what she got. You're both so happy. You hug. And then she uh, blows Drew Carey while you're fucking him from behind. Is was this a tour? Did they have That's to say dynamite play by play? Keith. Thank you. Was that a tour? <laughs> yes, it, well, it was that we were at South by it was when I was on the Gethard show. We did. We were doing a, a set at, uh, uh, you know, show at South by and they had the the whole or no, maybe it was a, no, it was Comic Con. So they had the whole setup there in the in the arena where, yeah, they were doing like they had the wheel at okay. the end or whatever. And they had. Yeah. Drew, Drew himself, I guess, couldn't make it. So we had to settle for the cardboard. cutout. It's best. <laughs> yeah. It, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We had some fun with that one. <laughs> I enjoyed it very much. All right. Well, I'm excited about the show and it's very good uh, catching up with you again. Yeah. You too, guys. Thank you so much. And happy uh, six, sweet 16. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, be sure to join our join our chat room uh, tonight, of course. And we'll be on the stereo app, stereo.com slash Keith Malley or stereo.com slash Hemda. Make sure you're subscribed for free uh, to our names. Uh, we do some fun shows on there. All right. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>